Good evening, everybody. Isaiah 56 says, My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Anybody hear that? My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. That means everybody. It's all inclusive. So I think that'd be a good way to start. We'll start with some prayer and we'll start with some prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this place that you've given us. We can come in. We can be a part of the family of God. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We have a future hope in heaven of all eternity he's been with you. We've been serving you here and now. So, Father, tonight, hear our, our praise, hear our worship, hear our voices. Let it be a free offering arising before you tonight. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand? Let's do some worship, okay? Okay. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Oh! 
that God would do something, whether that, whatever that meant, whether it would be God establishing something, whether it be breaking ground for a new place, whether they be digging in where they're at, whatever that looks like. Here's what he sent back to you and to all of us. He said, we want to let everyone in the barn know the results of a chicken dinner and fundraiser they had yesterday. They did this for raising money because they wanted to establish their own place. They've been meeting in the office buildings downtown or having a Bible study in Dale and Carl's home and trying to get people <clears throat> established. He says, anyway, thank you for praying with us and supporting us. We had a total of twenty. Three thousand dollars donated at the end of this day of the chicken dinner and raising. That's something that God does. We will be giving the matching money. Somebody said up to ten thousand dollars. They would match in addition to that. So they will be offered bringing the total to thirty-three thousand dollars. It gets better. This will allow us to pay cash for the building at the closing because they're buying the church there. The so land pay cash for the for the building at closing on June 15th. Since we wrote the offer back in April 15th, we have been blessed with about $76,000. We will have a little money to do some maintenance work they need to do the building. The church has been going for four years now. And last Sunday, a holiday weekend, we had about 47 people attending. It is a very humbling, it is all very humbling to be a part of it. We want you to know that your support in prayer and finances toward us is of great value to the little town of Freeport, Michigan. It is always a comfort to us to know that we are partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ and yeah. serving together with you, Carl Dale. Yeah. Not only that, we are being the exchange. I'm kind of looking forward to maybe to go back someday up there and help again. I don't know what that's going to look like or when it will be, but wow, we were up there to have. 10, 15 people, and now they're hitting 47. God is good. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive our tithe offering here.
Father, it's, it's one thing to have a fancy building, but it's one thing way more above and beyond that to have a body of believers that trust in you for everything. Father, help us to reach the nation for your son Jesus. Use us. Use the offering to bless the world. Father, it's our prayer that your holy word reaches every nation and hearts are transformed and turned back to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, our youth, we have um, the Christian church over in Mount City, and that's where they're going to go together, I think, for a camp this summer for the kids 6 through 12th grade at Shalom, and the cost is $200 for kids, and that's 4 or 5 nights. I'm not sure if it's Monday or Saturday morning or Monday or Friday, it's the third week in June, and I'll have to get later, so if you are um, interested in that, let me know. We're going to do like um, mission projects in the morning and then camp stuff in the afternoon. So, yeah, let me know if you want to be a part of that. <laughs> and if you can't be there the entire time, then uh, that's okay too. And the finances are an issue as well. July. 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 I said July. Yeah, it's July. Yes. July. Not this month, but next month, and it's coming right around fast. So. Yes. Yes. Sorry. That's totally separate from our farm. Family retreat. Yes. Totally separate. <laughs> but all good. All good. All good because God is good, right? Oh, yes. We need to think about it all the time. Some people probably think we did. <laughs> oh, except that God's good. <clears throat> so I forget when I wear these things that I have issues with my microphone cooking on something. So I'm going to hold this tonight. So it's awkward for me. That's all right. Because what? God is good. Oh. <laughs> yes, and all the time. God is good. good. Yes. So tonight, we are continuing. I got some peacocks. <laughs> got some beatboxes in tonight's message. So tonight we're continuing in our series, Going Deeper with God. And uh, it hasn't been the easiest messages to deliver, but it's been some good God-working stuff. Amen? Amen. So tonight we're continuing this. Let's just begin in Proverbs chapter 6 once again. Verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Now, each week we've been breaking these down one by one, and we're figuring out, we're discovering the underlying issue of that, going deeper in the really meaning of what what that has to do with, and then on the flip side, how we can better serve God and love God. Amen? So the first time, the first week, we looked at the haughty eyes, and we learned that that is a place of arrogance and pride. That is the underlying current of that. And on the flip side, we please God, and we show that we are loving God by being humble servants, loving and serving one another. Amen? And then we looked at a lying tongue, and the undertone of that is deception. And how the enemy loves to deceive, taking partial truths and twisting them so that we are caught off guard. And so we need to have a tongue that is refined by fire, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that we can speak the truth boldly, and we can speak the truth with power and with authority and with response. Yes. Yes. And last week we looked at hands that shed innocent blood. But further than that, not just the act of murder, Jesus says, before you get to that 
point. He says, even if you have that bitterness, that, that underlying current of anger and resentment within you, that's just as bad. Ouch. And so on the flip side, we quickly go to those who maybe have offended us or those who we're dealing or having a trouble with, and we settle that argument if we can. We settle it in our hearts for sure, right? And we have peace in Christ, and we continue on. So tonight we're going to break down the next two. I'm going to finish the series next week. We've got a lot of greatness coming up the next two weeks, the last two weeks of June, and then, um, yeah, just good stuff. We have a lot of fun mission stuff coming up that we're excited to tell you about. And so, stay tuned. <laughs> right back here, next week, next time. Proverbs 6, verse 18 says this. A heart that devises wicked schemes or plans, and feet that are quick to rush into evil. Now, <laughs> Both of these, if you put them together, a heart that devises wicked schemes, actually, if you look at the underlying current or tone of this, it all has to do with idolatry and rebellion. And feet that are quick to rush into evil have to do with greedy desire. And all those put together, idolatry, rebellion, and greedy desire will make us impulsive to sin and make our hearts make us turn to rush quickly into things that are evil or no good or mischief. So we're going to learn tonight deeper in the word of how this affects different ones and some different scriptures that I have, and we're just going to see what Jesus tells us deeper into this issue. A heart devising evil schemes and feet that are quick to rush into evil. In Luke chapter 12, Verse 15. Jesus said to them, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. He's actually talking to a person who is concerned about his brother's inheritance. And the Lord kind of stepped on my toes this week with this scripture a little bit. <laughs> Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now let me just make one thing clear, because back to that deception, someone will tell somebody that, and then all of a sudden that person thinks that we can't have money, we can't have nice things. God is not against money or nice things. God created money and nice things. Jesus himself said, I come to have the fun of life and you have it more fully. Amen. Whether that's gifts of the Spirit, whether that is money, whatever it is. We are not to keep it all for ourselves because that is greed. And that just makes us want more and more and more and more. We're never satisfied. And we want more and more and more and more. And we're continuously thinking and thinking about that. And just everything within our mind, within our heart, is trying to get more and more and more and more stuff. That makes our feet go quickly rushing in to things that are not good for us or that God never intended for us to have. Are you with me? Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Remember last week we talked about, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. That is the life in which we live when we give our lives and our hearts to Jesus Christ. He becomes our goodness, our wholeness, our possession. And if we lose everything, we realize that he is the only thing we need. Amen. Amen. So God is not against money or possessions, God is against the love of money. Money becoming our idol, our possessions becoming our idol, our material things becoming our idol. Right. Amen. Just as Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.10, the root of all evil is the love of money. The root of all evil, think about that. Think about our world, the root of all evil. I will tell you, within every place where social 
injustice is running rampantly, there is someone with the root of greediness and evil because of money. Whether it is a drug cartel, whether it is human trafficking, whether it is any other disgusting acts of immoral stuff, there is a root of money funded by greed and ran by greed and hearts that are deceived and hearts that think it is all about stuff and money. And it causes other hearts to be deceived and to fall into that place. And people to be hurt, and people to be destroyed, and families to be wrecked, and families to be destroyed because somebody at the top is getting a lot of stuff that you're never going to see. So know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen? Amen. <laughs> um, so let's look at John. Chapter 12. Familiar story. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary, she took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, <laughs> Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. So you read up to that point in the oh, Jesus was concerned about the poor people. Read on, verse 6. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And what do we know about the thief? He comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put into it. So greed. Ran by greed, a heart deceived by greed. So let's look what Mark has to say about this same encounter in Mark 14.10. Mark's talking about this same place where Mary broke the jar, the alabaster jar, poured it on Jesus. 14.10, then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, remember his heart was deceived by greed. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. So his heart that was deceived by greed, by idolatry, by rebellion, ran to the chief Pharisees to betray Jesus. He ran into evil. For more money. For a few pieces of silver that he will never take with him. <laughs> Truth? So on the flip side of that, we looked at Judas Iscariot and how a heart deceived. On the flip side of that, let's look at another character. In Genesis chapter 39. I don't have time tonight to preach about the whole story about Joseph. who had a dream about his brothers, and his brothers were jealous of him. And his father apparently showed favoritism because he was the youngest, and they made this coat for him. And so his brothers were so, they had so much hurt, so much jealousy, so much discontention with their brother. They went off to do some work. And Joseph's father sent him to check on the brothers. And in that process, the brothers see Joseph coming. Just a little background here. And when they see Joseph coming, they come up with this plan. They're going to throw him in this empty cistern. And they're just going to leave him there to die. Let God. So then they see 
this caravan coming, these Egyptians coming. And so they actually, they say, well, let's just sell into to them, and then we won't have to worry about it. So they sell Joseph into slavery. They get to Egypt. They sell Joseph once again to Potiphar, a rich man. They sell him to him. So once again, he is a slave. And he is there in Potiphar's house. And the mistake of Potiphar was that he left everything in his house to Joseph to watch over him, not paying attention to the needs of his wife. And so in Genesis chapter 39, we see these words actually. Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care, but Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Big mistake. Right? Husbands. <laughs> now Joseph, the Bible tells us he was well built and he was handsome. And so because of lack of attention, Let's just say, Potiphar's wife all of a sudden became attracted to Joseph, and one day she tried to seduce him and get him to sleep with her. And we see in Genesis 39, 12, she caught him by his cloak, and she said, come to bed with me. Now listen to this. But he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran out of the house. He ran out of the house. So we see Judas, he ran into sin by his evil desires. We see Joseph, a man who was living right for God. He ran away from sin. And guess who ended up in prison? Now some of us would say, let us advise. Seem fair. But here's the thing, if you continue on the story, while he was in prison, God was with him. And long, long story short, it's a fabulous, wonderful thing that would take a whole series to do, probably. But Joseph ended up being the man in charge over all of Egypt during severe drought and ended up being the one who actually gave food to his starving brothers, just as his dream had foretold before. So can I just tell you, if you have a dream that you're holding on to that God has given you for years and years and years and years, let me just tell you, in the prison where you're at, in the darkness where you're at, in the waiting wherever you are at, God is with you, and he will see it to the finish line. He is faithful. He is good. He will fulfill his promises. Just as he said, not in our timing always. But he is faithful, amen? So back to this giving hearts. Let's just see a few things that the Lord has to say about this. Acts 20.35, remembering the Lord, I'm sorry, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Luke 6.38, give and it will be given to you. Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. This is the only place where God tells us to test him. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 13, 16, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. And 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves cheerful giver. Amen. So, how exactly do we keep our hearts pure? How exactly does that look? I can find no better place other than where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Colossus in Colossians chapter 3. Living this way. Colossians 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. What were we here last week? I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. You've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Not setting your hearts on earthly things. Set your hearts on things above. And the glory of God, the only unimaginable thing, <laughs> treasure that we will have when we get there. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, your thoughts, set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. We waste so much time with our minds worrying about earthly things that don't matter. 
So Paul says, set your hearts and set your mind on Christ and the things of God and the kingdom yeah. of heaven. <laughs> For you died crucified with Christ. And your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts 
And whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So the Apostle Paul is telling us, basically, when you set your heart and you set your mind on the things of Christ, your heart will remain pure before him. Because you will not be focused on earthly things, earthly desires, idolatry, rebellion, greed will not rule your life. Paul just has a better way of saying it than I do. <laughs> he had more experience. But. A few scriptures about the heart. Deuteronomy 6 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 1 Samuel 16 7. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Lord. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart, and I'll put a new spirit in you, and I will remove you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. A softness of heart where God can massage and marinate and work through and penetrate to the deep darkness of our souls, for lack of a better way to say that. And of course, Matthew 5, 8, Jesus himself on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So it's a heart issue, is it not? Yes. It's all a heart issue. And the reason that I think this list in Proverbs tells us that the Lord hates these things is because these things all trickle down from a place of pride and rebellion which turns people away from God. And when people are turned away from God, they are turned to sin and hurt. A place of darkness. And King David knew this better than most of us. King David, the man who was called the man after God's own heart, but his story Although it's sometimes sad, it's sometimes uh, encouraging as well. Because how many of you know sometimes we fail? And sometimes we forget to set our minds and hearts on the things of the Lord. And sometimes we find ourselves in a place we never intended to be. And that's what happened with King David, actually. His men, his fighting men, they were out battling in the war fields. So they were out, you know, they were busy. But King David, he remained at the palace. And while he was at the palace, one day he happened to look out the window. Ooh. There was a girl named Bathsheba who was married. But his lustful eyes made his heart fill with greed and desire that was not from the Lord. And he called for her and he committed sin. And he committed adultery. She became pregnant. David had her husband killed. David thought he had hidden all these things that no one would know, and one day a prophet named of all things, Nathan. How you Nathan? I'm not sure. A prophet named George came. <laughs> came to the door and um, basically informed David that yes, the Lord knew of all of his sins. So this, this psalm is really written about that. I mean, and he just says, begins it with, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. How many of you know we can still have that today through the blood of Jesus? Amen. 
And David is just pouring out his heart, so sorry for his sins. And he gets to verse 10. And in our Bibles, we know it as this. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast or right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. It's a great passage of scripture. It's a great one to read over and over and over again, but this is the kicker. As we're learning on Wednesday nights, the Hebrew undertones of some of these words so that we can understand our Savior even better. Verse 10 begins with, create in me a pure heart. If you look at the message translation of this scripture, it says this, shape a Genesis week from the chaos in my life. Now that's kind of a catchy little way to say it created me a pure heart of God, and you know that me. But what really blows my mind when I learned this about this word create in Psalm 51.10, that word create, it's a Hebrew verb. And the Hebrew verb is where we get the word Genesis. And Genesis meaning creation and meaning beginning and meaning making all things new. So thinking about that and the place in our hearts, shape a Genesis week. From the chaos in the life. Sometimes life just seems like a bunch of chaos. So I get to looking at this. Genesis, the beginning. And I get excited. But I won't apologize. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless, shapeless, empty. Dark. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And you've heard me talk about that, how exciting that is. Because even in the formless, in the shapeless parts of our life, in the deserts, in the chaos, in everything that's going on, in the emptiness, in the hurt, in the pain, in the grieving, in all of that, in the darkness, the Spirit of God is hovering over and shielding like an umbrella. We're not alone. And then God said at the perfect time, at the perfect moment, the Spirit of God spoke these things into being. And suddenly there was light and there was vegetation and there was plants and there was animals and there was sun and moon and stars and oceans and everything else that we just love to look at. And he created man in his own image. And when David says, shape a Genesis week, Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, Lord, take my heart. Take my heart in all of the darkness and deception and evil and hurt and pain and grief and ugliness of it. Father, would you just take that place? I recognize you are hovering over me. I recognize, Lord, you are shielding me. I recognize you are protecting me. And Lord, right now, I also recognize that you still love me. Even through my sin, even through deception, through my greed, through my ugliness, through my idolatry, through my rebellion, Lord, you are still here with me. Father, would you take my heart? Would you remove the stones, the hardness? And would you just make it soft to receive from you, create everything about me new that you created me to be, for my image to be once again like yours, Lord, in Jesus' name. Suddenly, that verse means a little more, doesn't it? 
And so here's the thing for tonight. I'm going to shut up. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. We need to preach this again, so settle back in. Let's see, we were in Genesis 1. Let's continue with Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> No beginning. No new beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. I don't care. I don't care how holy you think you are. <laughs> there is some place in your heart where God can work. Amen. There is some place in your heart where God can recreate. And I don't care how far away from God you are. We just heard he hovers and he waits. And maybe tonight he's waiting for you to say, Lord, I recognize I recognize that what pleases you is a heart that is pure to you. A heart that has its mind set on you. Father, the things of this world can turn us away from you. Father, I pray tonight that you would bring us back to that place. That Jesus, you are more than enough. You are more than enough, Jesus. Yes, Lord. You are more than enough for what we need. And Father, your word promises that you provide every need that we have. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you that, that you know us better than we know ourselves. Yes, and Lord, tonight I just pray, I just pray as we move on, Father, that your Holy Spirit is ministering to each one of us tonight. And Lord, as we go to the communion table tonight, Lord, that you would just move us to be moved by your spirit. Father, we would respond with love and compassion to you. Father, we would respond with excitement, knowing that, Lord, you can take the chaos in our life and the emptiness. And Father, you can fill it with the goodness from you. Father, fill us to overflowing tonight with your goodness, with your mercy, with your grace with your love, with your instruction, with your correction, with your peace, with your joy, whatever it is we need tonight, Lord, meet us there and have your way in this place. We give you all the praise and glory. In your marvelous holy name we pray. Amen. that I can think of no other way to end that message than with this old song. And I'm not saying that it's going to be impressed by me because I know you won't be. <laughs> but I'm saying it because of the words. And then when I get done with this, I'm going to have our worship team come back up. I'm going to have Pastor Earl come and lead us in the time of communion tonight. But let's just set our hearts before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24. It says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. See, here David is asking God to search him. He didn't say, Search my boss, search my neighbor. Search my coworker, search my enemy. He said, Search me, O oh God. Not somebody else. Now we can't say, What's wrong with that guy? What's wrong with this guy? Or search me. And reveal to me what's wrong with my heart. And he goes on to say, even down to the point of searching my very thoughts, exploratory surgery of my mind. Go in there, God. Show me where the sin is. Because who can point out sin better than our God? Who knows what it is? Who can reveal it to? I'm going somewhere, if you could just go bear with me, but when we come to the communion table, we will have God to search us and reveal through his holy word, through the through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through his written word, we understand what sin is in our lives. And it says before we go to the communion table, it says, examine ourselves. And we know what sin is. We know because we've read his word. We know the difference between right and wrong. What's holy, what's sinful. And if we examine our heart, so you won't have to examine us. But when people start thinking about their sins, before they even come to the communion table, they let themselves be talked out of. I have been so unworthy because of my sins, and I'm not fit to come to the communion table. We hear that lie sometimes, don't we? I mean, the Holy Spirit. We'll review that, but the enemy tries to tell us that we're unworthy. And before I'm telling you tonight, instead of running from the community table, we should be running to the community table because that's where your body will grow for us. That's where your blood will shed for us. And we remember that he died on this cross and he rose again. From this point forward, I, I would hate for anybody to say, I, I'm more than the community table. But I hope and pray that they come running to the community table for that simple reason. That they will find healing and help and restoration and salvation is found in no other place than in Jesus Christ and what he did for us. I'm going to read and pray for communion prayer. And then we'll come up and, and I pray that you also examine yourselves. Because if there's anything we have against a brother or sister or against or something that we've done, sin that holds us from the Lord, we can just you know, get right with God before we partake of His supper. We don't want to do it in an unworthy manner. We want to be found not that we're worthy because we're not worthy by anything we've done, but we're worthy by the grace of God and the Lord. Yeah. Paul said, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in of me in the same way after supper. He took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this room whenever you drink it in the of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink your cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it returns. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We thank you that we can come to the cross, to the foot of the cross, to the altar, to the communion table, and we can find healing and hope. 
restoration, salvation, eternal life is found to know the name of the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And Father, we believe and we trust that tonight. Father, let our feet be quick to run to you. Father, let us be quick to run to you and run away from sin. Let it no longer have any control over us. For we know that freedom is found in no other place than in your name. Lord, tonight, examine us, reveal to us, point out our sins, point out what keeps us from being all that you call us to do, and then help us to be forgiven of it, to cleanse us of it, and to get on with the life that you've created us to have, that good, better, blessed life. Father, tonight we stand before you. We understand that bread represents a broken body that took our place on the cross. It took our place without punishment. We thank you for that. Father, we understand that that blood, that cup, that juice represents your shed blood, washes us clean. Father, without being cleansed from our unrighteousness, we'd still be lost in hopeless. But with you, we have all hope. We have blessings. We have a future. We have opportunities. We have love. We thank you for giving me praise and glory. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think y'all should be running on up here to get you some communion tonight. What do you think? Amen.
would encounter the light of the living Jesus Christ. But those that just need reminded, there is a God in heaven who cares about me. But they will be reminded. There's someone seeking so much what God wants them to do. And can I just tell you, beloved, tonight, God wants you to come to him with trust, with all your heart, that he knows what's best. So as we're talking tonight about running away from our sin, running away from the things that are not of God, once again, would ask that you would run to wholeness and healing tonight. Don't let this moment pass you by. So when I count to three, run. And I'm going to agree. I'm going to pray with you tonight. You've got to meet every need. And we would encounter the loving, wonderful, real, living God. The rules, rules and reigns. Do not allow yourself to be ruled and reigned by things of idolatry and rebellion and greed anymore. Run to God to receive wholeness, healing, and more than enough. So one, two, three. In Jesus'
talking about is this is our Lord. Consider these things and do your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Lord, stretch out your hands and heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders in the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And we as God's people, we need to be laid hands on each other and to pray and speaking and pray boldly. Thank you. 